I'm Kevin Davis, and this is the Catholic Family Podcast. And well, we got a good one today. One of my pet topics, I guess you could call it. It's something that I've talked about on many, many occasions. It's something I'm very passionate about, and that is music. I, I suppose musical theory in a way. Well, we'll get into it as you see, as we get into it, you know, kind of what, what is good music? What is bad music? And as we start, we are going to do this show with a priest. Unfortunately, it didn't work out. He couldn't make it um, due to, well, priestly duties. So we're going to do it on our own. Hopefully we'll have the priest on again at another time, perhaps also with Eliza, perhaps, you know, just with the priest to talk about more of the moral side of it. There is going to come into this, our opinions on morality, our opinions on what you should or shouldn't listen to, it is our opinions. Just keep that in mind. We're not moral authorities. I know Eliza would say the same. So no worries. This is this is opinion. Please, we, we hope you enjoy it. We hope that you, you know, take it into consideration or we wouldn't be having this show. But if you really have doubts or, or you know, issues, take it up with a priest. That's totally fine. Um, and, and of course, again, we might have that show hopefully soon with a priest to cover Probably similar topics, but from a totally different point of view, which is awesome. I think that's that's a really good way to do it. That it's like, okay, you know, here's going to be Eliza's view of it and the study that she's done, and then we can also get it from a priest. So, so Eliza, maybe introduce yourself a little bit. We've had you on the show before, and we've covered a little bit about what you do, but maybe remind people why this is something that you're interested in and why you can talk about it a little bit. Okay. Uh, well, my name's Eliza. Um, I am a musician and I've been a musician since I was a little child. Um, and that's the reason that I, I love this topic so much is because I definitely had a natural inclination from childhood towards music. So um, I also ended up in, um, in school. I got a degree in um, flute performance. So I have a classical degree in classical training in music. So that involves music theory, that involves performance, that involves instrument pedagogy, that involves piano, that involves uh, orchestration and arranging and all of these things. Like basically all the moving parts of music, I, I got a pretty good understanding of just about all of them at a surface level. Of course, I'm not, a, don't have a graduate degree. I don't have a doctorate. I didn't go so deep into it like, like that, but you know, I got a degree in music. So that gave me a really good background. Um, to understand not only all the details, um, but also how music affects us and how basically we got a little bit of like music therapy, almost like a touch of it in, in my training. And um, people only ever touched on it, just saying like, yeah, by the way, you can use music to, to heal people. And basically like some people go a new age way with it and some people go a more technical way with it, just biological where, you know, there, that's a whole other degree program, more or less, and I didn't go into that field, but we got a little idea of it, and that that sparked a little bit of an interest in me to look further into music rather than just, oh, I'm a musician, I play music, I perform music, I'm in the orchestra, I'm in the bands, I do all these genres, but more so, why am I doing, what is the power behind it, and how much more is there that I haven't even touched yet? So when I got out of school, I went into all of that on my own, more or less. And luckily, uh, <laughs> at the last year of my college, um, my, my last year of college, my senior year, I converted to the to the Catholic faith from, um, well, to what I thought was the Catholic faith at the time. I converted from Protestantism to, um, to Catholicism. And uh, I came in through the Novus Ordo and then became more traditional, more traditional, and so on. And, you know, within a couple of years, I was full-blown set of a contest. So that was nice. But um, so... I was blessed to be able to do all of that research on the morality of music, on the power of music and all these things with the light of, of the faith and understanding true morality. So um, I'm glad I didn't go into any of it before I converted because I might've easily gone down these new age paths of weird, you know, mystical stuff that's not good. Um, so I'm really glad I went into it at that, you know, with the light of faith. So. Um, that's a little bit of my background. I, I play a lot of instruments. Um, I sing. I, I'm a choir director at our church here in El Paso. I teach them. I teach the the people that come, whoever will come. I teach them um, how to play. Well, I'm trying to start with instruments, but right now we're mainly just doing voice and vocal technique and um, choir and choral music and reading music and rhythm and all these things. So just general music. So I've been teaching for years, um, private private students for how many years now like seven eight now long 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 time now um so i'm very thoroughly like saturated in music it's my entire 
like purpose. So <laughs> that's that's why I do. That's why I've, I've gone down this path now, and that's why I'm here right now. So that's my cool. background. No, it's exciting, and, and it's it's again, it's something that that I really appreciate because I again, it's some it's a topic. It was one of my first podcasts. One of my first ten or so podcasts was a de the devolution of music with a good buddy of mine, Matt, down in Australia, and it's. It's really interesting, and neither of us were experts. He'd done a lot more research, but it's really, really fascinating. It's something that's really stuck with me ever since. And it's again it's with someone who has zero training in music. You know, I I, I picked up singing Palestrina from my church choir back when I was a senior or man, okay, a junior in high school, and so I've I've sung in church choir, so I have an idea of what church music is. And of course, I I was also a wedding DJ, so I played. I I've, I my expertise is I've heard a lot of music, so so that's where I'm going to be able to comment on this. Like yeah, I've listened to that, but that's about it. So, but no, so yes. we're really glad to have you on. And so I know you wanted to start kind of from the the high point, I suppose, of music. And if anyone wants to go, I'll try to remember to attach that podcast that we did before because it's really fascinating. Kind of the the peak of of music when when of course it was aiming music, you know, to, to God, directing it towards God. I'm sure that's probably something you're going to bring up. And that was Gregorian mm -hmm. chant. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So we can just dive right into Gregorian chant. So, um, I've given some, I've actually given a more than one like workshop conference on Gregorian chant, even when I was in the adult community, cause I was teaching people Gregorian chant and the adults and all mm -hmm. these things and traveling various places and doing that. Um, so I've actually got my old uh, outline from that and I'm just gonna breeze through parts of it because we don't need a whole in-depth talk on this. It's, it's just a good foundation. So I'm just gonna give you the main, the right from the definition, what is Gregorian chant? And this is straight out of a music appreciation textbook from school. I mean, it's it's the secular understanding of, of what is Gregorian chant, but it's a great definition and they, they pretty much got it. So according to this, Baseline definition, Gregorian chant is melody set to Latin texts and sung without accompaniment. It conveys a calm, otherworldly quality. It represents the voice of the church rather than an individual. Its rhythm is flexible without meter and it has little sense of beat. Its free flowing rhythm gives Gregorian chant a floating, almost improvisational char uh, character. So this is straight out of a textbook hmm. and it's pretty much hits the nail on the head. Obviously there's more to it that we know of, you know, because being Catholic, we know, well, there's a lot more to it than just that it's pretty and floaty, right? You know, like, yeah. but um, that's the basic definition. So if you go into the history of where did it come from and how long have we had it, we've had it for a long time. It goes all the way back to the synagogues in the Old Testament, um, the type, types of chanting. So it's very ancient in origin. It's not just from the Middle Ages, it's ancient. So sacred church music evolved through oral tradition. This is after the time of Christ now into the age of faith. Middle Ages, approximately 450 to 1450 AD. That's kind of a ballpark period of the Middle Ages. And this is when it was standardized and notated, but it came from oral tradition. So it goes a lot further back than St. Gregory the Great, right? So Pope St. Gregory the Great uh, established Gregorian chant as the official music of the church. Now, um, that's why we call it Gregorian. So we have uh, at this point in history, this is like 590 to 604 ish AD. Now we have a standardized um, ideal for church music. But this standardized ideal for church music isn't just for church music. It's actually the ideal for all of Western classical music tradition, complete the complete standard and the beginning of all of that. So all of our modern, um, even modern, but all of our, I'll say all the classical music tradition, provided that it didn't deviate into a more modernist type of, you know, kind of a different idea, provided that it's consistent with the period of time that it that it came from Baroque classical, we're talking Bach, Haydn, Mozart, even Beethoven until a certain point, and even some of the romantics, all of that type of music, provided that it follows the form it's supposed to, harkens all the way back to Gregorian chant. So it has its origin in the divine, and that's why it's so good for you. So anyway, I'll get into that later. But <laughs> um, so uh, we can talk about the structure of Gregorian chant. Now that we know a little bit of the history, let's talk about the structure. Um, the reason it's the ideal, the reason it's so good for you, the reason that it's healing, the reason that it lifts your soul to God, there's so many reasons. It's not just like, oh, the church said it's good, so let's listen. Well, that's a good reason, but there's more than that. There's You can go into all the technical reasons as to why it's good for you. Um, and I think if you understand these things, you will have more of a love for it and you'll have a deeper appreciation for it rather than just, yep, I like it. This is what we listen to at church. Yeah, I know it calms me down. I feel good. But now you can actually see, oh, wow, no, this is needed. We need this. It's not just good. It's that we need it really badly. We need this, especially in our day now. So 
let's talk about the structure. So Gregorian chant, there are three M's that you can remember. They're a little technical, but they're easy. Uh, once you once you have a basic understanding, they're, they're not hard. Monophonic, meterless, and modal. Monophonic, meterless, and modal. Those might sound crazy technical. What do you mean? Well, monophonic literally just means mono, single line, a single melodic line, right? So there's not a soprano, alto, tenor, bass uh, of Gregorian chant with all these harmonies intricately woven. That came later. Uh, in Gregorian chant, you have a single melodic line. So it's built on melody. Melody is, is, is the foundation rather than harmony, rather than rhythm. Melody is number one. Okay, so that's what monophonic means, a single melodic line. Meterless. Meterless just means there's no 4-4 four, four time. There's no 2-4 time. There's no 3 time. It's not a waltz. There's no strict measured tempo rhythm. Not in Gregorian chant. We have rhythm, but it's free flowing and it's based on the length of the notes. It's not a strict rhythmic beat. Mm -hmm. So that's all that means. Meterless just means no meter, but there's still rhythm, but no meter. It's free flowing and smooth. Okay. Modal. Modal is a little more complicated, but it's, it's not too bad. Just bear with me here. Modal just means it's built on modes. It's built on tone centers. And the tone centers aren't necessarily just a key. Like, oh, this one's in B flat. Oh, this one's in G. Modes are more complicated than keys. Um, modes are entire tone centers and moods. They create a mood based on the scale degree. So what is a scale degree and why are you using all these fancy words? Well, it's very simple. Do, re, mi, fa, so, la, di, do. You can have a mode based on do and it's Ionian or major key, what we know as major. Salve, regina, do, Ionian. That's what it's called, Ionian mode. So that's a major mode. And so there's a lot of church chants in that in that mode. Um, Attende, domine, et miserere. We're singing that in Lent right now. That's Ionian mode. So that's a major, a major mode. Then there's Dorian, Phrygian, Lydian, et cetera. We don't need to know all the details. But these modes are tone centers that you vote, they, they give a certain mood and a certain um, sobriety and a certain joy and a certain um, sadness and longing, but always quite measured. It's never overly passionate. It's impossible for a chant to be too passionate. It's literally impossible. It's, it's restricted by its very nature from becoming unbalanced in that regard. So these modes are, um, they're really beautiful because the mode that a chant is written in gives a certain mood to reflect a certain season. That's why different um, seasons have different sounds. And that's why the Curie from the Misa de Angelis and all of the chants in the Misa de Angelis, number eight, that everyone's pretty much, everyone's heard that. You know, if you're a traditional Catholic, you've heard that probably at every wedding you've ever been to for the most part, but that's in the Ionian major mode. It's, it's bright and joyful and peaceful and great. Now then listen to something more solemn and more heart-wrenching, a little more longing but still very measured. And that would be the Misa Orbis Factor, which is number 11, which is for Sundays throughout the year. Right? A little more sad, more minor key, right? And that would be probably in the Aeolian mode. I think it's Aeolian. It ends up being like a minor key. Um, so that has a certain sound to it versus a happier key, right? There's differences for a reason. So, and we have these set at different times of the season. The Kyrie Misa de Angelis is for feast days. The Kyrie for the Misa um, throughout the, the masses throughout the year, the Orbis Factor is more solemn, more um, more more um, serious, more, it, it, it's almost people say, oh, it's kind of like longing. It's it's minor, but it's so beautiful, but it doesn't bring you down. It's not sad. So anyway, there's a lot well, more. Real, real quickly, I, I, I just sang something with my brother. We sang um, the... The, the mass for, or no, it was the, boy, what did we sing now? I just think of the antiphons for the purification. So the, yes. was the second of February, oh, that, it was funny. Cause I, I I'm not a big, uh, you know, ch I, I can sing it. If, if I have someone who can lead it, then I can sing the Gregorian right. notation and, and whatnot. I'm not great, but I can do it. Right. Boy, there was one of these antiphons that was, it must've been a mode that was down. It was down <laughs> the, 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 you know, the list of modes somewhere pretty far. Cause Boy, that the tone was very unusual, very different, and, and oh, yeah. very, very, I think sad. I mean, a very, just a very different sound. And, and, and you really notice it when you sing it. It's like, whoa, right. I, I, you don't hear this very often. And so it's, it's certainly not as common as the others. It's, it really is fascinating when you when you get into it. And I, I didn't know the science of it. That That's really fascinating to, to, to hear that, especially after having just sung it. So it's, it's yeah, a, it's a yeah, no. different mode. Okay. Yes. And you'll be surprised when you, let's say you're singing, um, Sundays throughout the year, just, you know, you're singing every Sunday and you sing a gradual and you sing the Alleluia or the track, or you sing the, um, 
the uh, any of the mass proper's those ones you'll find some crazy modes in. Usually mm -hmm. the mass itself will pretty much be consistent. Like if it starts in if it starts in um, Ionian or Aeolian or, Do or Dorian, it's going to stay there. It's not going to move all over the map. But sometimes these proper's will throw you off. Like what? Where is Do? And how do I even? How, mm -hmm. Oh, I lost it. Let me find it. And it's because oh that one's in Phrygian. That one's got a darker tone. That one's like something I haven't done a lot. You know, we're used to Ionian. We can sing Salve Regina with no problem, right? Because it's like, right. oh yeah, I know these notes. This sounds like a major scale. But then you get into some of those others. It's like, what what is going on? I need to start over. I need an organ. I need help. Right. Like, where's dough, it's, right? right? It's not it's not as intuitive, right? It it, yeah. it really is kind of because it has these these different layers of notes. It's it's much much more difficult for your brain because yeah. I, I think as you said, it's just because we're probably because we've been listening to it since we we're kids, or I mean, I have. I mean, so you you yeah. just you hear the normal tones and, and then, and then you don't You're like, what? Yeah. yeah poor yeah. choirs. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. yeah. That's why sometimes, uh, uh, if you rehearse for mass proper, sometimes they come together with no problem. It's like, Oh, that offertory was easy. And then another offertory, you get to the communion and even though it's only like barely even two lines, it's much shorter mm -hmm. than the offertory. You guys can't even get yourself through that first line and you just have to keep starting over. Like what happened? What happened? Right. It's just how it is. It's that's the beauty of chant. And but anyway, so yeah, we'll we'll keep going. But yeah, no, modes are really cool. Modes are really interesting. So um, do you have anything else you want to add before I move? No, no, the... please keep going. All right. Okay, so after the modes and some of the technical stuff that we understand, what is chant and stuff about that, let's go into the philosophy of it a little bit. So this is Thomas Aquinas, and it's also the ancient Greeks, and it's also beyond. So um, you know, we have the ancient Greeks had a lot of really awesome things to say about music that I think we would do well to heed their warnings better. Um, and I think, unfortunately, since we haven't, well, that's why we're in the predicament that we are in today. Uh, we haven't heeded the warnings of even Plato, who had some great wisdom on this, and Socrates and others, and Aristotle. But anyways, so music is made up of three distinct parts. So we already talked about the three Ms of the structure of it. That's more technical. This is a little bit more general on just music in general. The three distinct parts that make up music, melody, harmony, and rhythm, in that order. Melody, harmony, rhythm. Melody is number one, harmony is number two, rhythm is number three. Okay. So this is the ideal. And the ideal applies chiefly to sacred music, but it also applies to all types of music. Not every single song or, or piece can meet this standard. Um, and not every song needs to meet this standard because there are certain times where you'd want certain other um, things to reign supreme. For example, you might not want rhythm to be in third place in a military march. You need to be mm. more towards number one in order to make it so that people can march for long periods of time to hype them up for battle and things like that. So there there are places for this ideal, you know, so to speak, to be inverted in, in but it has to be done carefully, right? It has to be done carefully and, and it has to have a purpose and a, and a higher reason to do that. Otherwise, it's going to become disordered. So the 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 hierarchy is really important. Melody, harmony, rhythm. So melody is the purest part of music, which appeals predominantly to the intellect and engages the soul above the body. That's why it's number one. It's the most pure part of the music. Number two, harmony. It's subservient to the melody and it supports and it enriches the melody. That's its purpose. And if it doesn't do that, you need to look at why and now is this good for me, right? So, um, it, it appeals to your lower, lower faculties. It will appeal to passions and emotions as well as the intellect and the will, like melody. But in a sacred setting, so so in a sacred setting, it's important that the harmonies are appealing to passions in a in an ordered way, in a balanced way, so that it doesn't become distracting and take away from the from the mass or, or you know what's meant to be happening. And and these emotions are good to be engaged. It's not evil to engage mu emotions and music in, in the sacred liturgy. It's not evil, of course. I mean, we we have Palestrina for a reason. Um, provided that it's done in an ordered way, because you want to enhance love for God and spiritual things. You want to bring joy on a feast day. You want to bring sorrow and Lent, but all well-balanced and orderly. So that's the that's harmony's role. Rhythm is subservient to both the melody and the harmony. It's number three, and it provides the structure and time to the music. So it's important to understand this. I think some people will go too far. They'll, they'll know, like, they'll learn, like, oh, Music is all about like, like modern day music, for example, is all evil because, you know, every beat is really strong or something. And they'll say, oh, it's all the rhythm. There's some truth to that, but there are distinctions you need to make because rhythm is not evil. Rhythm is necessary and it's vital and it's even vital to Gregorian chant. Without rhythm, we wouldn't be able to sing together. We would all be doing different things. So there is rhythm in Gregorian chant even. There's rhythm that's necessary to all types of music. 
And it's a good thing in itself. It's not evil. It, it, of course, nothing God created is evil in itself. It's what you do with it, right? So um, rhythm is really important to provide structure and and um, time to the music because we are in time. We don't live in eternity yet. And the beauty of Gregorian chant is that it reflects the timelessness of eternity by being free flowing and rhythmic. That's and in a rhythmic way that's not strict measured tempo. So it reflects eternity, but not. It's not a perfect example because we're never going to understand what that's even like on this side of eternity. We won't understand true timelessness. But the closest you can get in music would be Gregorian chant. I would. I would say. And I think most of the philosophical people that talk about it would agree with that. Um, but so we have to understand that creation is rhythmic. The seasons, the food chain, water flowing, waves on the shore, earthquakes, thunderstorms, seasons. I mentioned seasons twice now, but um, weather patterns, weather patterns, right? All these things are rhythmic. There are rhythms of nature. Our bodies are extremely rhythmic. Heartbeat, blood flow, respiration. So, you know, all of these things, digestion too, digestion is rhythmic. So all these things are, are important and, and it's not like, oh, rhythm's bad, so run away from it. Well, good luck getting away from it. It's everywhere. The wind is blowing in its rhythm, right? So um, so rhythm, the, the important thing to know is that rhythm has an immense power over the body and the soul, both, but especially the body. So once you understand that, you'll know that, okay, it's a good thing in itself, but it does need to be checked by these two. It needs to come in third place for the most part for the ideal for music to be ordered and good for you objectively speaking and very generally speaking as a general rule okay so um so chant is not chant is not really harmonized in the sense that we talked about before you know you don't have a soprano alto tenor, tenor and bass singing different chant things together to create a motet more or less out of chant we don't do that really you can do drones and things but on its own chant is mostly just melody but there's an important thing to know about it um Harmony is is actually built into it. So there is harmony. The chant does contain all three, even though it sounds like just melody. It does contain all three. We've already talked about rhythm, but we'll talk about harmony. It includes harmony. And I want to show this little whiteboard sketch of a little bit of a, probably backwards for you, but uh, you don't even need to see it very clearly. You don't need to read the words, really. Just seeing these um, these blocks and the nooms, it's, there's an important thing called active tones. Active tones are... It's a tone in any piece of music. It could be a Baroque prelude, but it could also be Gregorian chant. It's a tone that when you sing a melody or play a melody by itself, certain tones will continue to reverberate. They'll continue to reverberate even after you've moved on to half this stuff over here. And I'll show you an example of what that means. This is a, this is an intro eight, and it, the, the, the way it sounds is Statuit and so on. So you might say, well, all I heard was a melody. I didn't hear harmony in there. Well, especially in a cathedral or a large room, mm -hmm. you're actually going to hear that because what you're going to hear is you're going to hear this low note to maintain. It's going to continue while I've moved on. And my, my whole Gregorian group may have moved on, but you're still going to hear that resonance. And I'll show you an example. I have my piano right next to me, actually, just to, just to give this an example. So we'll switch it to key of C. to show you the point of in a cathedral setting you're going to hear that c it's going to carry on so the harmony is built into the melody so that's why gregorian chen is so perfectly balanced because there is harmony but it's built in and it's through those active tones and reverberation so and, it, and so I, I sorry real quick i got a comment and so that makes so much sense than why gregorian sounds better in a cathedral or something than in a little oh, tiny yeah. church so because so, we, we, we've had this discussion because we, we sing, of, of course, Gregorian masses here in our little parish. We have a decent choir, small mm -hmm. and in a tiny little church. And so we're always like, OK, it, it sounds fine. We're singing the same as we do in the when we sing in the cathedral. But, you know, it's, something's wrong. And, so, and, and obviously we know of the space and that, you know, this is why they built part of why they built the cathedrals, you know, because of the sound. And. But that makes sense. So I, I never considered it. It was because the, the bottom line is holding that. That is really fascinating. Cool. Yes. Interesting. And it's not just that. Yeah, it's not even just that bottom line. It's now when the when the tone shifts a little bit more. And now mm -hmm. there's another tone. And now there are three active tones. And in a cathedral, you're going to hear like four or five stacked. And now you've got a whole choral harmony with a single melodic line. And that's mm -hmm. why ancients, you know, had all this wisdom of space 
the space that you're in is it's not just the music you play or sing it's the space that you're occupying that's why they had halls that's why we have cathedrals like you mentioned um the the buildings were built to create that so mm -hmm. you know and then some of them have this crazy echo where it, you'll mm -hmm. you can test it and it goes on and on it's really cool but there's a reason for that and it's because it's basically to unlock the fullness of chant because chant is beautiful no matter how you do it but in it's it's when you sing it in a closet it doesn't even compare to the beauty that you hear in a cathedral it's just and it'll lift people out of their seats just wow mm -hmm. you know they'll so feel true. a they will ascend they feel themselves ascend and it's because god is lifting them through that beauty and he's lifting us it, it through the beauty that that comes through the music and and it's a, and it's a reflection of eternity when it's sung well it can convert people i mean mm -hmm. it's so anyway, that's kind of the conclusion on Gregorian chant. I don't want to keep going too far on it. I just want to wrap it up by saying for Gregorian chant, it's the ideal form of music because it contains all three aspects, melody, harmony, rhythm, in a way that can never undermine that hierarchy. It's always ordered. It's impossible to disorder it. You'd have to mess with it to disorder it. But on its own, it's completely pure, and it's the purest form of musical expression, period. That's why it's the standard. And that's why all of Western classical tradition is built on Gregorian chant. So it's it's really important to understand that before we get into anything else, because everything else that we talk about, classical music, modern music, pop music, rock music, we have to understand the foundation and the ideal before we even touch those things, because how do you know how to discern it if you don't have your standard, right? Right, so, no, exactly. Well, and, and, and to see again, how it's, it's so interesting how you can see how society goes goes kind of down at the same time you know you had the because i mean you had the height of the middle ages you know really the height of people as far as we understand you know giving themselves to god building these cathedrals for goodness sake you know and, and you know and really their entire lives were spent for god and not just the monks but yeah. even even the normal people that had a much different idea of eternity and yes. and in their lives. And, and, and I think that's, that's sure. It's not like they were all saints. They weren't all moral, but there was still just a different mentality. And you see as the time goes and as people got more humanistic and, and, and that's, that's again, as we see, as you go through the, the Renaissance, you know, you get more humanistic and the music very quickly goes Zoof! and it goes, it goes, falls off as I'm sure you're going to talk about it, but it's so fascinating. I think that's, it's one of the most fascinating topics because you can directly connect society and morality with music and, and i mean in, in a way obviously looking in yes. hindsight but it's it, it really is absolutely fascinating and i think we, we, i think since we've gone 27 minutes i think we're going to wrap this up as part one I, I, I no not a complaint at all I, I i seriously just learned so much about gregorian it's awesome <laughs> um and i'm gonna go i'm gonna go find a cathedral to sing and the good thing is I, I live in bavaria i have a lot of cathedrals i can sing in, so that, that's pretty cool but um but i think we're going to end this as part one i think i think that's going to work well we're going to use this as part one and we'll go on um, to do part um, two and probably part three. I, I guess we'll see how it goes because I think I know you have three different topics you want to talk about, but this mm -hmm. one was was very fascinating. Thank you for that. I, I don't want and it, since we're ending this here, I want to do a couple of shout outs for you guys. I know you and your husband run Crusader Filmworks. If I can get it up mm -hmm. on the screen, there it is. Crusader Filmworks. That's on YouTube. You guys have some awesome content. Yeah. Um, really good stuff. I mean, you do some. You you sing. You play. And, and I know your husband does some editing as well. And you guys have soon coming out a video about, about the burning bush, right? Is that, yes. is that coming out? Yes. And I have to give all the credit to him. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, as, as soon as possible. No, 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 no it's, it's been announced. Um, but yeah, this, all the credit for Crusader Filmworks goes to Andrew. I'm just cool. kind of a supporting hand. Um, I'm not, I'm not the main, you know, person. He's the filmmaker. He's the editor, you know, he's the editor in chief, you know, Got it. so, <laughs> but um, but yeah, so well, the burning it's, bush. It's is great in stuff. The I mean, highly recommend. Cool. Yeah. Thank awesome. You. Well, well, we look forward to that. And but but really, go everyone, go check it out. Um, once once you're done watching this, go go check out their stuff. It's it's really really good. Some very motivational stuff as well. Um, we've we've mm -hmm. shared a couple of your videos or published a couple of your videos as well. They're they're really really good. Um, also on your you've got a website, um, yes. for well, for your music stuff. And so, what do people yes. find there? So uh, the, it's it's kind of um. Well, you'll, you'll find my backstory on there, a little bit of, of why I do what I do. Uh, you'll also find a lot of my original recordings. So various things that I've covered and created myself, sacred and secular. Um, and the whole point is because we live in an era with such filth 
that is called music wrongfully. It shouldn't even be called music nowadays. Some of it, it really yeah. shouldn't. Um, it doesn't really even meet the meet a basic standard. Um, so true. But but you know, but we need an alternative, and there is so much good folk music out there that people never find because we're too buried in the in the trash. You know, it's like there's just too much garbage to sift through to find it. And I think a lot of people will either settle for more or less. This one has more lyrics, so I'm just gonna deal with that and just all right it's close enough to what you know it's not gravely offensive so i'll just listen to it um some people will just kind of settle for modern music and just be okay with it um and then some people will just say no cut it all off we only listen to gregorian chant and and uh, mozart in my household right well both of those extremes are kind of bad they're they're both i i would say the wrong answer um you should love classical music you should love all types of music that are that are good and beautiful but there's a place for happy, fun, bright dance, you know, music for a wedding, for all this stuff. There's a place for that. It's just, you have to be able to discern it. And so a lot of people aren't able to even find it, let alone discern it. So my my goal is to create music. I made, I'm creating playlists of music that's not my own, like just folk music, um, modern, modern even music that's been written in the past couple of years, in the past year even, that's good. You just have to search and search and find these people because they're not your pop singers. They're not your rock singers. They're deep. You've got to look. They didn't sell their souls to the devil. So they're not out there on stage with Beyonce. Right. So you have to look a little deeper. Um, so I'm compiling those. So you'll find playlists. You'll also find some articles. I wrote an article by Gregorian Chant on there. It covers a lot of what I just talked about. Um, there's an article about, it's called the musical cleanse, which we'll get into in the, the next parts. The musical, the musical cleanse is basically just a regiment to purge yourself of the music of the world and all these, all this stuff that we're saturated in that whether we want to be or not, it's, it's affecting us. Purge yourself of that so that you can look at it with, um, with sound judgment and understand, oh, this is good for me. This is good for me. And you can see, well, that wasn't so good for me. Let me put that aside for the sake of my spiritual life and things like that. So I created that regimen. Uh, again, that's completely subject to the clergy and and their um, their discernment and their um, decision on that. You know, it, it, there's nothing, you know, it, take it or leave it, you know. But uh, so there's that. And there's also, I, like I said, there's playlists that I'm compiling. And then there's also a place for contacting me, my emails there. And then uh, if you want to collaborate with me for music and request me um, to cover certain songs, uh, the request that you gave me is in the works. It'll be out nice. March 7th. Um, so uh, things like that. I just got new recording equipment. So I'm really excited about that. It's going to sound way better now. It's not my wow. USB mic and trying to desperately trying to mix things like really <laughs> badly manually and, and audacity it's not easy to do that i don't know why i didn't upgrade sooner but whatever but anyway so i have new recording equipment i've everything is going to start really we're going to up the ante a lot so um please send requests there's guidelines for requests there's uh basic guidelines for basic discernment of music like um things to look out for and watch out for like oh certain rhythmic uh, structures like oh okay and there's an example a youtube link of examples of instrumentals so that you can see what they sound like and understand why i should avoid them rather than just don't listen to rock it's bad you'll go to hell right we need a little more some people need more than that some people that's good enough they're like i'm out of here i don't like this right it's i hated it anyway but what about younger people that grew up with it and they don't understand why and then they're just frustrated because you're taking away something else they like to listen to and they found a song that didn't have impure lyrics so why not and all these things so um i'm trying to basically unearth all the all the old wisdom and put it in a in one place that is accessible and um that's the whole point of the website so there are articles coming and more things coming but that's the gist of it awesome no that sounds good that 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 is um worth going checking out guys go check it out old school music studio.weebly.com um we'll be back for for part two um yeah i don't know when i'm going to publish it probably a few days from when you're watching this um and i'm going to try to remember to put this in a playlist man oh man if i could ever learn to be organized this would be a lot better podcast channel but eliza thank you very much seriously i just learned so much i, I really appreciate it we'll be back for part two here in just a bit until then eliza everybody else god bless thank you